The speakers are Alexander Logunov from University of Princeton and uh, Eugene Malinikova from the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. The title is Nodal Set of the Laplace Eigenfunction and Propagation of Smallness. Uh, uh, thank you very much for the introduction. I, I would like to thank the organizers for all four years in efforts to organize this event. Uh, so this is a joint talk with Eugenia, and we had some fighting how to do it. And there will be two topics in this talk. Uh, the first one is about zero sets of Laplace eigenfunctions, and we will talk about some recent results in this area. And the second topic is a more classical one. Uh, it's about unique continuation or its quantitative version propagation of smallness. I want to explain why there are two topics, not one. So uh, I will talk about one question about zero sets of Laplace eigenfunctions, so-called Yao's conjecture. And around 25 years ago, Nadirashvili uh, proposed to plan how to attack this problem. And uh, he formulated two questions. About the first one, we will talk in the first half. It will be a question about zero sets of ordinary harmonic function. And the second question was a question related to the Cauchy uniqueness problem. And so far, the second question is still open. But there is a simpler question, which is due to Landis, that we would like to discuss. Uh, OK, here is a plan for today. Uh, so we will speak about nodal sets, and nodal sets is just the name uh, for zero sets of Laplace eigenfunctions. And here you can see a kind of very nice picture of uh, the sign of our spherical harmonic. So if you look at two-dimensional sphere, look at the, the Laplace eigenfunction there, uh, you can see here black and white areas, and they show what is the sign of the function. And the interface between black and white is a nodal set. You can see um, you no know, structure and chaos, and you can ask many questions that arise directly from the picture, and we will talk about some questions. Uh, if uh, you have, uh, so typically the questions are asked on Riemannian manifolds with or without boundary, uh, but you can always think about simple examples that are already interesting, the example of torus or example of uh, two-dimensional sphere. Uh, on torus, you can think about uh, trigonometric polynomials of two variables. On two-dimensional sphere, you can think about restrictions of homogeneous harmonic polynomials. Uh, so uh, let me uh, tell you some very amazing facts about uh, nodal sets. So, if you live on a two-dimensional Riemannian manifold on a surface, then the zero set is a union of curves. And these curves, you can see the picture separate the manifold into several connected components. You can see here uh, black and white islands. And uh, the connected components are called nodal domains. Uh, one Amazing results, uh, which is due to Corin, tells you how large can be the number of nodal domains if you take all eigenfunctions and arrange them in the increasing order of the eigenvalues, then the case eigenfunction has at most k nodal domains. Uh, at the same moment, there are examples when there are only few nodal domains while the are, say, you can construct 
uh, spherical harmonics of very high degree which have only two nodal domains. Uh, another fact that you see directly from the picture that the zero sets of uh, Laplace eigenfunction becoming denser and denser as uh, lambda goes to infinity, and this is a mathematical fact that the nodal sets of Laplace eigenfunction with eigenvalue lambda is uh, very dense. Near each point on the manifold, you can find a point from a zero set with distance smaller than c over square root of lambda. And there are several conjectures that are they have a striking evidence from numerics and from the picture. So the, the one that I would like to talk about is the Yaw's conjecture. So if you live on n-dimensional manifold, zero set is n minus one dimensional set. And you can ask how large the n minus one dimensional Hausdorff measure is. And Yaw conjectured that uh, the Hausdorff measure of the zero set is comparable to the square root of lambda. So there exists a lower bound and upper bound with some numerical constant that do not depend on lambda. And you can think about that as of a, a high frequency statement. This everything here is interesting when lambda goes to infinity. And there is another conjecture which is called quasi-symmetry conjecture. On the picture, you see black and white areas, and you can take their volume and ask whether the volumes of uh, uh, the set where the, the eigenfunction is positive is comparable to the volume of the set where the eigenfunction is negative. Uh, Yao's conjecture is stronger. It actually implies quasi-symmetry conjecture. Uh, and uh, uh, no, so these were two questions that arise directly from the picture. And uh, I would like to tell you what is known about uh, these conjectures. So, first of all, uh, the Yau conjecture, it, is, uh, uh, it was proved in dimension two by Brunink and also by Yau. And then uh, 10 years later, uh, Donnelly and Pfefferman uh, they prove the conjecture in the case when uh, the metric is real analytic. And uh, uh, it's completely non-obvious how the real analyticity assumption hel helps. But the work of Donnelly and Pfefferman, it produced a lot of new ideas. Some of them are useful in the smooth case where the conjecture is still open. Even in the dimension two, if you have a smooth Riemannian uh, manifold, if you have a surface, uh, uh, I didn't mention it, sorry, but everywhere here, you can assume that you have a, a Riemannian manifold without boundary. Uh, and uh, even in dimension two, we don't know uh, whether the upper bound in Yao's conjecture is true. And there were several completely different approaches to attack it uh, by Nadirashvili, by Donnelly and Pfeifferman, and due to Dong. And uh, the previous bound in the two dimensional case was lambda to the power three over fours. Uh, concerning the higher dimension, the situation was. Uh, uh, rather humble, the upper estimates were like super exponential and concerning the lower bounds, uh, they were not as quite as you expect them to be. In dimension three, uh, there was a bound, okay, there were several uh, groups of people working in this direction. On lower bound, there was a work of Colin and Minikozy when they first proved the bound with lambda to the power three minus n over four, and it gives you uh, a constant in dimension three and some negative power of lambda in higher dimensions, while you expect that actually the volume should grow to infinity. And uh, also there was the work of Sok and Zeldich, and actually 
Uh, these two works, all of them use uh, SOG ALP bounds of Laplace eigenfunctions. And I would like to mention also the work of uh, Stefan Steinerberger, which gave the same bound, but it was completely different. It was involving heat flow, and actually his method is uh, quite useful when you try to estimate uh, zero sets of uh, sums of eigenfunctions. So that was the story, and here are the new results. Uh, so uh, the lower bound in Yao's conjecture is true in any dimension. At the same moment, uh, we know that there is a, a polynomial upper bound uh, with some power that depends in a very awful way on dimension. And also you can, uh, there is some room for improvement even in dimension two for the upper bounds. You can improve three over four by some tiny epsilon, but it's not clear whether how to approach one half. Uh, so now I have formulated the result of the first half, and uh, uh, let me now tell you about one of the questions that Nadirashvili asked in order to attack Yao's conjecture. So here is a question about ordinary harmonic functions in R3. It looks very naive, but I don't know any non-trivial proof. Uh, and uh, here is a question. So uh, assume that you have a non-constant harmonic function in R3, uh, zero set of a harmonic function in S3 is a two-dimensional set, and Nadirashvili asked whether uh, the area of the zero set is infinite. Uh, so let me uh, first mention, you can ask this question in any dimension, and in dimension two it is not difficult. So in dimension two, zero set of a harmonic function uh, so first of all, the Liouville theorem tells you if you have a constant function that there is at least one zero, but in dimension two, actually, zero set is a union of analytic curves, and each curve is not allowed to have loops. And if you're in dimension two on the plane, then there will be, okay, it's, if you have a closed contour and the harmonic function is zero on the boundary of the domain, then it should be identically zero everywhere. And it's actually not difficult to show that a harmonic function on a plane, every non-constant harmonic function on a plane, has a zero curves that go to infinity and has therefore an infinite length. But when you are in dimension three, you can imagine a surface, unbounded surface, closed, which looks like a very narrow cusp, almost a needle, which, and you can construct a surface uh, to be so narrow that it actually has a finite area, but not every set can be a zero set of harmonic function, and there is a, a some structure that prohibits it. Uh, so uh, first, let me say uh, that uh, yeah, the statement is true, and uh, more useful is its local version, and probably rescaled version. So if you have a harmonic function, and you know it is, that it is vanishing at the center of the unit ball, then the area of the zero sets inside of this ball would be at least some universal constant. And uh, uh, this, I don't know any way to prove this statement that is related to R3, and every proof that you have is working for uh, elliptic PD of second order in divergence form. And for applications, the rescaled version is more useful if you, instead of unit ball, you have a ball of uh, uh, radius r, 
then and you also know that the function is vanishing the, the center of this ball, then there will be a lower bound with a scaling factor, r to the power n minus 1, and this is a rescaling factor which comes from the fact that the Hausdorff measure, n minus 1 dimensional Hausdorff measure is not scale invariant. Uh, so now I would like to explain how this question is uh, related to the question about Laplace eigenfunctions. So here is a trick that allows you to pass from one PDE to another PDE. Sometimes it is useful, sometimes uh, uh, it's completely useless, especially when you try to talk about distribution of the values of harmonic fun of the Laplace eigenfunctions are but as far as zero sets are concerned, this trick gives a lot of information. So here it is. So assume you have a, a Laplace eigenfunction on some manifold, and uh, then you just add an extra variable t and multiply your old function by exponent which depends only on a new variable. And if you adjust there, constant in the exponents, put it to be square root of lambda, then this product appears to be a harmonic function on the product manifold. This trick is working on any manifold. And the, the wonderful property of this trick related to the uh, zero sets is that the zero set of a new harmonic function is a cylinder over the zero set of the old function. And if you know something about zero sets of a new harmonic function u, you can certainly extract some information about zero set of a Laplace eigenfunction. Uh, so let's try to use this trick. And uh, uh, I will explain in the case of Helmgold's equation in Rn how to deduce Yao's conjecture from Nadirashvili's conjecture. Now we take Nadirashvili's conjecture as truth and also its rescaled version. And now imagine that you have a, a unit ball in Rn, you have a solution of Helmgold's equation inside of this ball. And now you assume that lambda is sufficiently large just to provide that there is at least one zero in a in sight of the unit ball, and uh, actually the zero set of solution help goes equation is C over square root of lambda dense in Rn. This is a fact from PDE, which is not difficult, but I ask you also to believe in it. Uh, okay, uh, so here is a setting. Uh, uh, if you try to use uh, Nadirashvili's conjecture directly, use it with the lifting string that we discussed before, the thing that you get immediately a constant lower bound. But in the statement of Yao's conjecture, you have square root of lambda, and there should be some gain from somewhere, and the gain comes from uh, rescaling. So we have a, the fact that the zero set is very dense, and it implies that there are many disjoint balls of radius 1 over square root of lambda such that the function phi, the solution of the Helmgold's equation, is zero at the center of these balls, and the number of these balls is comparable to lambda to the power n over 2. Uh, and this is uh, lambda n over 2. This is how the volume is rescaled when you make the change of 1 over square root of lambda. And uh, now we will use Nadirashvili's conjecture applied on the scale 1 over square root of lambda for each of these ball. You actually apply Nadirashvili's conjecture on the lift of this function on the scale 1 over square root of lambda and then project it and gain that in every ball of size 1 over square root of lambda, uh, v0 at its center, uh, the Hausdorff measure of the zero set is at least uh, some constant times the scaling factor, which is 
1 over square root of lambda to the power n minus 1. And now here you have uh, two scaling factors that compete. One is from n-dimensional volume and another one is from n minus 1 dimensional measure. And this is the place where you win square root of lambda. Uh, so uh, summary is that if you know Nadirashvili's conjecture, it's not difficult to uh, show that the, Yaus, the lower bound in Yaus conjecture is true. However, I will not be able to say much about the proof of lower bounds of Nadirashvili's conjecture, but I want to say that it is very closely connected to unique continuation problems. Uh, so I would like to mention uh, another fact that came from the work of Donnelly and Pfefferman. Uh, they showed that there are some gross estimates for Laplace eigenfunctions on Riemannian manifolds without boundary. Everywhere here, we assume that there is no boundary. And one of way is to say it, so there is a quantity which is called doubling index. You see it here. You take twice larger ball, so doubling index for a ball is defined by the following quantity. You take a twice bigger ball, take the maximum over here, and divide by the maximum over twice a smaller ball. And then for some reasons take the logarithm of this quantity. And Donnelly and Pfefferman showed that for any ball on the manifold, the doubling index for the eigenfunction is smaller than some constant times square root of lambda. And uh, uh, using uh, this estimate of the Donnelly and Pfefferman uh, and uh, this lifting trick, you can uh, actually formulate the, uh, uh, the counterpart of the upper bound yeah, in Yao's conjecture, in terms of harmonic functions on manifolds, you can actually forget about manifolds here. You can think that you have a, a solution of elliptic pit. Oh, sorry. Uh, where am I? Uh, yeah, you have a solution of elliptic PD, and you know that some bound on the doubling index, and you want to estimate. Uh, the Hausdorff measure of the zero set in terms of the doubling index. You want to compare the size of the zero set in terms of growth of the solution. And here is uh, the harmonic counterpart of the Gauss conjecture. Uh, I think that I, I would like to mention some intuition about harmonic function. There is a re remarkable property. Uh, so if you have a harmonic function on the plane, you can compare the growth of uh, Laplace eigenfunctions, or oh, sorry, growth of harmonic function and uh, the length of its zero set. Uh, if, you look with, if you work with uh, uh, holomorphic functions, you know that the more zeros a holomorphic function has, the faster it should grow. But at the same moment, there are a lot of holomorphic functions that look like e to the z or e to the e to the z, which have only, uh, they ha which have no zeros but grow arbitrary for us. For harmonic function, the situation is a way better. You have lower and upper bounds. Uh, so let me, Okay, I have to run a little bit faster to give a room for the second speaker. And I, I, I would like to mention that the work of Donnelly and Pfefferman, it's initiated the study of the distribution of the doubling index. And uh, are, you can actually, uh, if you know something about distribution of doubling index, doubling index decodes some information, the zero set. And uh, if you, s um, I skipped one slide, so I'm trying to uh, overcome this difference. And let me formulate a conjecture, which, in terms of doubling index, which uh, is equivalent to the Yaus conjecture in dimension two. So assume for a moment that you have a surface and you 
split it into, okay, you cover it with uh, geodesic balls of size, roughly one of a square root of lambda, so that every point is covered at least once and at most 10 times. Uh, and uh, now you, for each of uh, the ball, you assign the doubling index and you ask what is the average for the doubling index over all these balls. And there is a conjecture that the average, on average, it should be smaller than some numerical constant that does not depend on the eigenvalue. And there is a weak form of this conjecture, uh, which said that at least half of the balls should have a doubling index smaller than some numerical constant. And I, I just want to say that one of these conjecture implies the Yau conjecture in dimension two and another conjecture imply the quasi-symmetry conjecture. Uh, and I think it's time to change the speaker. I would like to say last word that both lower and upper bounds are connected to the questions of unique continuation. And uh, we are very unsatisfied about what we know about unique continuation, even for ordinary harmonic functions. Thank you. Okay. Now. Okay, thank you. So as Sasha said, we are not satisfied with, about what we know, but we know something about unique continuation, and it helps both to understand the zero set and solve some other problems about elliptic PDs, and I'll try to explain what we know about unique continuation. I will start with a very classical and well-known result that gives you intuition that solutions of elliptic PDs behave like analytic functions. You don't need to assume that coefficients are real analytic, just elliptic equation with minimal regularity, Lipschitz coefficients will give you results that remind behavior of analytic functions. And I'm referring to unique continuation property that is a classical result going back to Kordeman, Calderon, Aronshine and Cordes, Hermandes, and it tells you that if you have a solution of elliptic PD that vanishes at one point of infinite order, then it vanishes on the whole connected component. It's a starting point for our discussion, and we will need a quantitative version of this one. So what I mean by quantitative version is also classical three-ball theorem. Instead of looking at a point where a function vanishes of infinite order, I'm saying that I have a function that is small on a ball inside my region. Plus, I have a priori bound in a larger ball, say it's bounded by one, then we know that in the intermediate ball, the function is bounded by constant time, this epsilon to some power. Toy question to have in mind when you look at this, think about the real part of z to the power n. It's a harmonic function bounded by one in the unit disk. When n is large, it's very small, in, say, one quarter of the disk, and then you know that it's really small in one half of the disk. The behavior is like for analytic functions, like in Adamar three circles theorem. So once again, we see real entity without any smoothness of solution. And the result, as far as I know, is due to Landis from 60s. The first proof was given there. There are several proofs that are available now. At the same time, Landis asked if you can go further and replace the small ball by a bad set, but still of positive measure. So can you do this propagation of smallness from not a ball, but some set of positive measure inside? And the question is if you can get the same bound as before. There were some previous results by Nadirashvili in 96 and Vesel in 2000, giving some estimates, but not as sharp in the initial Landis question. Definitely, we know that sets of positive measure, uniqueness sets, there should be a way to quantify this uniqueness and get a function of epsilon that goes to zero when epsilon goes to zero. But the question was if you can do it as a power of epsilon. And first, I'll formulate the answer. The answer is yes, we can do that. As soon as you have a set of positive measure, you can extend smallness from this set to a medium ball 
once again assume that you have fun a function bounded by one a priori, small on your set k, then you can extend the smallness. And here, constant c and alpha depend only on the measure of k plus constants from your uniform ellipticity and Lipschitz constant of the equation, but not any geometrical quantity of the set k is coming into play, it's only the measure. More precise way to formulate it is the following one. The proof gives you the following estimate. If you fix the doubling index, the ratio between the values of double ball and the unit ball of your function, then you know that the ratio of the maximums of the absolute value of function over ball and a complex subset of this ball is bounded by the ratio of the measures to the power that depends linearly on the doubling index. If you look at this inequality for a minute, you will recognize a P condition or John Nirenberg inequality. So another equivalent formulation is that log of any solution to elliptic PD is in BMO, something that is known, what we are adding to this information is that the BMO norm is bounded by the same doubling index. So once again, to understand the doubling index of solution of elliptic PDs will give you lots of information about the solution. One example when we know something about the doubling index, as Sasha mentioned, is the case of lifts of Laplace eigenfunctions. So if I go back to eigenfunction and reformulate this result there, you will see the following inequality that tells you something about distribution of the eigenfunction. The supremum over any compact set is bounded from below by quantity that goes to zero exponentially in square root of lambda. If you heard some talks today, you will probably think that it's not very satisfactory information, but the plus is it holds on any manifold. And for example, on a sphere, this is sharp. On two-dimensional sphere, you can hope for anything more than that. It was conjectured by Donald and Pfefferman, and it follows from the estimate we were talking about. Now some words about the tools. What we actually do, we study the right version of the doubling index. It's so-called Almgren's frequency function. If you have a solution of elliptic PD, roughly speaking, you look at the average of this solution over a sphere, take the logarithmic derivative, multiply by R, and look at this quantity. It's called the frequency function of U. It gives you some information of what is the right power of the polynomial with which you want to approximate your function. If you start with a polynomial, with a homogeneous polynomial, and compute the frequency, you will get twice the degree of the polynomial. If you fix a point and start to shrink ball around this point, look at the frequency, that what you'll get is the order of vanishing of the point, of the solution at this point, modulo factor two. So this frequency function gives you all information about the zero set, also actually about the critical set of your function. If you construct the frequency function from u, go and limit when r goes to zero, you will reconstruct both zero set and critical set. And the doubling index is more or less a feasible version of the sorry, fractional function is the version of the doubling index when you don't go from ball to the twice ball, but you measure what is the change in a very short time. So there is an equality between the doubling index and the frequency function from both sides. And actually the last part here, it's a consequence of the famous result of Garofalo and Lin, who noticed that if for harmonic functions, the frequency is just non-decreasing, it's 
simple exercise after you know what to check. For solutions of elliptic equations, you see this monotonicity, trace of this monotonicity. This is all mon monotonic function if you multiply your frequency function by e2 constant times r, you'll get a non-decreasing function. And this is the main tool that allows us to get some information about the distribution of doubling index. I'm cheating a little bit because this tool is good for my initial question that I formulated on Landis, unique intonation from sets of positive measure. This tool gives you ideas what to do if the sets that you care about are of dimension n, or at least larger than n minus 1. This is not enough to go to zero sets in Yau's conjecture. But it allows us to go to sets of co-dimension. It allows us to do propagation of smallness from sets of co-dimension less than 1. And it's what you expect. Once again, the zero set has dimension n minus 1, so any set of co-dimension larger than n minus of dimension larger than n minus 1 is uniqueness set. As soon as your solution is small there, you suppose that you can extend the smallness. And you can do it. What is a little bit surprising, the estimate is the same as before you have this epsilon to the power alpha. Once again, if you believe in this analogy that elliptic functions behave as real analytic ones, it's what you would expect. Any set of positive n minus 1 plus delta Hausdorff measure is set of positive harmonic measure, and this estimate is more or less trivial when you talk about real analytic functions. But the message is you have exactly the same one when you go from real analytic coefficients to Lipschitz coefficients in the elliptic equations. If you want to go back to zero set or beyond dimension n minus 1, you need more tools, and one of them is also a well-known inequality for elliptic PDs. It gives you a quantitative version of the Cauchy uniqueness. We all know that if you have a solution of elliptic equation with Cauchy data that is zero on some relatively open subset of the boundary, then the solution is zero. There is a quantitative version of it. As far as I know, once again, it's due to Landis originally. There is another approach and proof of von Hoalin using Kerleman inequalities. If you know that your Cauchy data is small, then you can estimate the maximum on each compact subset of the function, of the domain. And this is the second ingredient that helps you to gain some information about distribution of the doubling index or frequency function over the domain. Talking about propagation of smallness, it allows us to propagate smallness for gradients of solutions from really small sets. We can go beyond dimension n minus 1, but just a little bit. We know that there is a constant, positive constant, small one, depends on the dimension, I guess such that you can extend smallness for gradients of solution from set of dimension less than n minus 1. This is nice, but not satisfactory, because we assume that something like that should be true up to dimension n minus 2. The zero sets of the gradient of co-dimension 2, so you would be assuming that you can go to n minus 2 plus any delta in this result. We don't know how to do that. There is a recent beautiful work on critical sets of solutions of elliptic PDs by Ron Naber and Daniel Valtorte from last year. And they give, among other results, a nice quantitative version of the estimate of n minus 2 dimensional Hausdorff measure using the doubling index. Their answer is like e to the power cn squared, 
If you think about your favorite examples and basic examples from coming from harmonic functions, you'll probably conjecture that there is something quadratic and then the not exponential of the quadratic. But let me go back to the ideas that we tried to present. The zero set, the information of the zero set, and also for the critical set is encoded in the distribution of doubling indices or frequency function. The frequency function is a modulated nice tool because of this almost monotonicity formula that is due to Garofalo and Lin and allows us to study distribution in a nice way. And the question that you get is if this frequency function is additive in some way. When we try to collect smallness from different parts or when we try to understand how the doubling index is distributed, you try to get some idea of the additivity of this function. It's far from being additive, but there are some nice partial additivity results that are very helpful in these problems. And going to the bottom, the only tools from the elliptic PDE that we use over all this work is three ball theorem and quantitative Cauchy uniqueness. There are no actually new tools about elliptic PDEs that are introduced. We just use the classical ones in a new way, plus the monotonicity of the frequency function. I will end up with an elementary question that you can go to take and go back to your students and ask them, and hopefully they will solve one of those two. The first one is Cauchy uniqueness problem for sets that are not relatively open. For three ball theorem, we know how to go from the situation where your smallest set is a ball to any set of positive measure. And the very natural question that is famous in small circles, at least, we all know it very well from our advisor, is if you have harmonic function, usual harmonic function in R3 in the unit ball, say C infinity up to the boundary, that vanishes, say the gradient is, vanishes on set of positive measure on the boundary, can you say that the function is zero? If this set is a nice set, the answer is yes, because it's Cauchy uniqueness theorem. If you are in dimension two and you know complex analysis, the answer is yes for any set of positive lengths on the circle. And if you don't assume C infinity smoothness, but just C1 plus epsilon smoothness, there is a nice counterexample of Wolf and Burgain and Wolf showing that this is not true. But for C infinity or C2 function, it's an open question. And another question connected to what we were talking about is if you once again think about harmonic function in R3, can you go in the result by Neber and Voltorta and show that the size of the critical set is bounded by constant times n squared. This is a very natural thing. All examples that you will come up with will give you this bound, and it's still an open question about harmonic function in R3. Thank you very much for, for your attention. Any question or comment? Yes, um, although most people have been interested in nodal lines for eigenfunctions of the Laplace operator, uh, some people like Zeldich and Hanin, they looked at also eigenfunctions of a harmonic oscillator in two dimensions, let's say. And there are some results if they take uh, random combinations of eigenfunctions. So do you, know, you think your methods can also give information on this uh, type we, of... We can hope, but I'm not sure this is the, the case. Yes, the, this lifting trick is very 
specific for, for the problem and it allows you to study harmonic functions instead of solutions, instead of eigenfunctions. I don't know if you have another answer to this. Sorry. Uh, well, maybe it's more related to the first part of the talk. Uh, in the donnelly Pfefferman uh, result, is it required that metric is analytic or both uh, manifold and metric is an analytic? It's the, it's the metric that is real analytic. Is met, okay. Metric is real. And all, the second question is, uh, anything is known about particular uh, manifolds like spheres and tori about uh, Yao's conjectures in the upper bound? They're, they're covered by the Donald Pfefferman result. Ah, okay, right. Those that's are real okay, analytic sure. and then okay. you have Yao's conjecture from both sides on, okay. on this one. So, right. Thank you. Is there any hope for propagation of smallness for non-divergence form elliptic operators? I don't know. There, there is always a hope, but <laughs> it's... Any other question? Uh, about... Uh, now, we need a the conjecture. Uh, his conjecture is stated for harmonic functions on Euclidean space. Is, is it possible that uh, his conjecture is still true for harmonic functions on some more general open Riemannian manifolds? I'm sorry, once again, which conjecture you refer to? Uh, Naji, we yeah, the the conjecture. conjecture, what Sasha told you about, it's proved uh, for solutions of elliptic. You, you mean the global yeah. version? Uh, I, I mean, oh. uh, if his conjecture can be stated in some more general form for uh -huh. Riemannian manifolds, for example, uh -huh. more general Riemannian manifolds, his uh, conjecture is still true. So, so if you ask about local version, like if you fix a ball on the manifold, then mm -hmm. it really does not matter which manifold you have. But if you ask about global, global, global yeah, I don't know. Uh, yeah. The yeah. Global case. Yeah, global. I have no idea anything about the global case. Yeah. Any other question? What? Is not the case. Let's send the speakers again.